Welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and I'm the Apostle for the Restoration of the Original First Century Faith. And in this Part 12 of Revelation Simplified, we want to talk about Mystery Babylon, as described in Revelation Chapter 17. But before we begin, we have uh, just an administrative announcement. I'll try to keep it brief, but it will take just a few minutes here. Uh, we came across some new information that there is not actually a need for the priesthood, the Melchizedekian order, to wear a uniform. And we found some instances in history to the contrary. So if you want to know more about this, I would encourage you to take a look at the article, What Would Yeshua Wear? It's in Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 3. And uh, it's uh, also on the front page of the Nazarene Israel website if you're watching this video as it comes out. But uh, one of the things that it covers is there's, without getting into all the details, there was a church father named Polycrates who was having a discussion with Bishop Victor of Rome, and they were discussing the timing of the Passover, which is this is where the whole Easter uh, controversy came about. So it's where Easter got entered into the picture around 180 CE. So Polycrates wrote uh, to Bishop Victor, and he's, he's uh, saying, moreover, John, and he's referring to the Apostle John, he said, who was both a witness and a teacher, who reclined upon the bosom of Yeshua, and being a priest, wore the sacerdotal plate. He says he fell asleep at Ephesus. Now, this is interesting because he says specifically, being a priest, we know there's a Melchizedekian priesthood, he says, wore the sacerdotal plate. Well, we don't have any indication that the Apostle John was a, a Levite, that he you know, could have been the high priest in the temple. So based on this, uh, and there's several uh, sources that tell us that there was only one John. And so if John the Apostle had to wear a sacerdotal plate, then that means there must have been a Melchizedekian breastplate or sacerdotal plate of some kind. Well, come to find out, uh, that's probably not how it went. There was also a, a fellow in Ephesus by the name of John the Elder. So his first name, also John, but he was a different John, and he was related to the family of the high priest. And we can read about him in Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 5. It says, And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, and then here's Yohanan, which we believe later became John the Elder at Ephesus. So uh, because there's uh, two Johns historically, uh, not just one, as most sources claim, uh, there, uh, we don't see at this time a, a need for a Melchizedekian order uniform, and we also don't see any history that there was a uniform uh, for the first 400 years. So if you're interested to know more, please read What Would Yeshua Wear uh, in Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 3, or again, it's on the front page of the website. But just continuing on, we want to get back to the Revelation study. So we're going to talk about the simplified version of the timeline. Uh, just to keep in perspective where we are right now, we've passed through the seven seals and the seven trumpets. At trumpet seven... There is a social quake. Things change. And the kingdom is taken from Babylon, the great harlot Babylon, and is given to the saints. Then we covered three inset chapters, chapters 12, 13, and 14. And then in the last set, we talked about the seven cups, or the seven bowls, but the seven cups of wrath, which are poured out upon those who don't follow Yeshua. They've chosen the Babylonian system. Then there were the three unclean spirits, like frogs, that are described in Revelation chapter 16, the last slides that we went through. And then at the seventh cup, there's a giant societal quake, bigger than any quake ever. And it's a societal quake because what it means is the entire Babylonian, Roman, Islamic, uh, Judeo-Christian, Islamic world is going to come crashing down. And the kingdom then will be given to 
us. The kingdom is given to the saints at trumpet seven, and the cups play out very shortly thereafter. That's the, the actual physical punishment upon Babylon. And there's going to be a gigantic shakeup in the world order at that time. Now, before we get to Armageddon, that the three unclean spirits like frogs are going out to marshal all the armies of the world toward, first we're going to have informational or inset chapters 17 and 18. It's going to describe Mystery Babylon in this slide set, and then in the next slide set, we're going to talk about Mystery Babylon's fall and what that means to us as a people. So let's go now to Revelation chapter 17, starting in verse 1. It says, Then one of the seven messengers who had the seven cups came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. And we know from our previous studies that waters represent people. So this is the great harlot that sits on many electorates, effectively. So this is an Esau Roman harlot, but the Babylonian harlot. Verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And as we've seen in prior slide sets, one of the great issues with Babylon is it's also it's centered around Esau in Rome and it uh, involves democracy. Democracy is a Greco-Roman Babylonian concept. So the whole world is attempting to get around this thing where we have the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and uh, Islam, but the three of them are being corrupted and worked toward and they're they're, they're fighting each other toward Uh, what is in the center, which is an Esau Roman democracy. And so it's because the kings of the earth are working with this Esau Roman democracy and not paying attention to Elohim and his needs and the people's needs, uh, they're practicing fornication. So let's flash back here to Revelation chapter 13, starting in verse 1. And uh, John, you know, this is the uh, Apostle John, or it could be the Elder John. So that's another big question. It says, then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Now in context, this is the first beast. This is a government beast. So it's, uh, but the, I saw a government beast rising up out of the sea or the electorates. It says, having seven heads and 10 horns. Now we'll see these again in just a moment in chapter 17. It says, having seven heads and 10 horns. And those are all symbols of power and authority. And on his horns, ten crowns. Now that means someone has conferred a kingdom on him. And on his head's a blasphemous name. So we're going to see also, well, there's, can just go ahead, there's a second beast. So in verse 11 of chapter 13, he says, Then I saw another beast, or a second beast, coming up out of the earth. Now the earth symbolizes government. So in this case, what we're talking about is a government or a state-sponsored religion. Now, this is uh, like we've talked about before. The United Nations is sponsoring what they call the United Religions Initiative, the URI. So the two main players, of course, are going to be Catholicism and Islam. So it says, then I saw another beast or a second beast coming up out of the earth. We're talking about the United Religion. And he had two horns like a lamb, which would be Catholicism and Islam, and he spoke like a dragon. So now we're going to go to Revelation chapter 17, and we're going to see these same seven heads and ten horns show back up. It's going to be, in a, as we've seen already, uh, between Daniel and the book of Revelation, uh, basically things change just a little bit. We're getting a, a little, a little, just a slightly different perspective. But it's still basically, it's all one beast. It's the Babylonian beast in two halves. So we're talking about a government half and then a basically a religious half. Earlier, these were the Babylonian spirits, and now the spirits are being manifested uh, in a much more active way. So let's come now to chapter 17, our current chapter, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman. Now, a woman in scripture is always represents a religious body or a spiritual body. For example, Israel is depicted most times as a woman in scripture. And I saw a woman, in this case, it's a state religion, sitting on a scarlet beast. Now, we know that this is the scarlet, this is the new world order beast. It's scarlet because it's Satan. 
And it's, so it's basically the United Nations coming to full power, bringing us to a new world order. So he sees the woman, the state religion, riding the government, basically, sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy because it's not what Elohim commands to be done. It says, having seven heads and ten horns. Okay, so continuing on. It says, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Now, this is the religious aspect, and we know that also they're going to make an image to the beast. But the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. So once again, fornication, that just mean, adultery just means to mix. So uh, what's being talked about here is we're, uh, and this is what the three main religions, the three Abrahamic faiths do, is they mix uh, what Yahweh originally says to do with whatever it is of their own traditions. So continuing on to verse 5. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So once again, there's all these abominations because it's being presented as this is what Elohim says to do when that's not actually what he says to do. It's something similar, looks like what he says to do, but it's not what he says to do. So, and Mystery Babylon is called, it's a mystery that it's Babylon because it looks like the worship now, forgive me for this, but with Judaism and Christianity, it looks like the worship of Yahweh in whatever form, or Hashem, or Adonai, or the Lord. But then in the Islamic sense, they also claim to be worshiping the Elohim of Abraham. You know, a lot of people get excited when I say that. Just try not to get excited. But uh, So there's these three main Abrahamic faiths that are claiming to worship the Elohim or the God of Abraham. But none of them quite get it right because we're still in the Babylonian phase. So it's a, but it's a mystery. It's all a mystery how this thing works to most people whose names are not written in the book of life. So let's continue on to verse 6. It says, And I saw the woman, we're talking about the United Religion, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Yeshua. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. But the messenger said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. So he's going to tell us the mystery, and it's going to look a lot like the other takes that we've looked at this same series. Now, whether we talk about the series of eight empires or the series of five Babylonian empires uh, nested within, they're all essentially, you could call them Egyptian or Babylonian empires, but they're all... Uh, let's take a look at the list right here. So the, these are the, a list of the nations that have afflicted Israel down through the centuries. So it's Egypt, Assyria, then we begin the Babylonian sequence, which is Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now in this list, we've split 0.7 into two parts. So uh, what we have is the part 7a is the Catholic Empire, and then we'll take a look also at part 7b, which is the Ottoman Islamic empire the ottoman caliphate so and then both of those have had uh, a deadly wound but both of those also stand to be revived now whether separately or together we believe together and then the ultimate crowning achievement is going to be a babylonian new world order of course that runs on the democratic principle because that's what uh, that's how the whole thing ties together uh, yahweh's word never speaks of democracy but that's what's being used because it exalts the opinions of men it's men, we don't want to decrease, we want to increase. Uh, this, but that's wrong, because the only way for us to increase is for him to decrease, and that's backwards. So continuing to verse 8. Now we get a lot of riddles in this, so I'm going to try and... Uh, so it says, the beast that you saw was, meaning it was Babylon in the past, and is not, meaning it was not Babylon in the first century, because Rome was occupying the land in the first century. It says, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition, which we'll see later is the lake of fire. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. So they, they're not, they're, they haven't taken the mark of Yahweh, they've taken the mark of the beast. 
It says, and when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. So they're going to marvel because if you don't take the mark of Yahweh, by default, you've taken the mark of the world or the Babylonian system. So we just saw the Babylonian sequence, but it begins in Egypt, which Egypt is symbolic of the world and carries through Babylon, which is a false system. So either we take the mark of Yahweh and we understand what's happening, or we don't take the mark of Yahweh, and it's all a mystery to us. So let's continue in verse 9. It says, Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And we know that Rome was built on seven hills and Mecca was built on seven mountains. So there's uh, technically Mecca is a closer fit because it does specify mountains uh, in the passage. But we believe that Rome is the primary fulfillment because Rome came first and then helped or assisted Islam into being as a kind of an outside of the borders operation. It's continuing to verse 10. It says, so a lot of riddles here. He says, but there are also seven kings. Now, remembering our list of eight, it says five have fallen. So we're talking Egypt and Syria, and then we begin the Babylonian sequence. So Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. He says one is, and then the next in the sequence is Rome. That's point four of the Babylonian sequence. He says, and the other has not yet come. And this is just the two feet of the statue. So the Roman style Christianity infused with Islamic clay. And then remember, there's one foot is east and one foot is west. It says, and when he, and when he comes, he must continue a short time. Okay, so now we're going to, as, as it comes up, we're going to talk about how, well, let's flash back to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 3. And it says, and I saw one of his heads. Now remember, we're talking about the government beast in context here. But I, a different aspect. I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And we can see that there was a mortal wound both to the Catholic side and to the Islamic side, and that both of these deadly wounds do stand to be healed. It says, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So again, that's what we're saying, is unless we're tied into Yahweh and his program, We can easily get caught up in the Babylonian program, what they got going on in rabbinic Judaism, uh, Christianity, whether it's evangelical or otherwise, and Islam or even Catholic Christianity in that context. Remember, it is slightly different aspects. We have to take a look at things. Uh, Or there's many people just plain living their lives in the world. Okay, so let's take a look at this list again. This sequence of eight empires. So Egypt, Assyria, then starting the Babylonian sequence, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. And then we come to what might be called the two feet of uh, iron mixed with Islamic clay. So again, one east and one west because Emperor Diocletian had split the empire into two parts and the empire then we'll see how it became uh, separated under Islam. And we'll get into a lot of good, a lot of very advanced stuff is coming up that's not actually in the book. But so part 7a, we've got the Roman Catholic Empire, which is part of its spiritual extension of Rome. And then we have the Ottoman Islamic Caliphate. And if the uh, Muslim uh, tradition got started by the Catholics in Rome, then it would be, again, similar to how the CIA runs uh, operations in other countries outside of the United States, destabilization operations. Uh, color revolutions, so to speak. So one might say that uh, if uh, Alberto Rivera's theory is true, that uh, Islam got started basically as a a color revolution in support of the Roman Empire to destabilize that which is outside of their empire. We're going to talk a lot more about the operation of Babylon as we go. And then finally, but remembering that the capstone, it all arrives in a, the culmination is that, of a Babylonian new world order. And that's what they're hoping for, except we know that that's being taken away. So uh, the fall of Babylon has been predicted at trumpet seven. And then we have the judgments are shown to us during the cups in, uh, in the narrative. And then it's coming now to Revelation 17, which is giving us more information about who Babylon is and then next chapter, we'll talk about her destruction. 
But we want to take a look again. So we're going to talk about Catholicism. Catholicism was formalized in 325 CE at the Council of Nicaea. Now, there was sort of a deadly wound delivered in 1517 in the Protestant breakaway or the Protestant Reformation. Or we might talk about how in 1588 CE, which is a time, times, and half a time, or 1,263 years after the formalization of the Catholic Church, the Protestant English Navy sank the Catholic Spanish Armada. And this effectively gave Roman Catholicism a deadly wound because uh, they no longer had military control over, over all of Europe. Uh, and so, of course, the ecumenical movement is seeking to restore this. We'll talk about that in, uh, in just a moment. So then Islam being the other factor here. So Islam got started in 610 CE uh, and then uh, expanded uh, different, uh, different empires. But ultimately, it came to be eclipsed by what's known as the Ottoman Islamic Caliphate or uh, an earlier version. They were attempting, they were essentially an Islamic state. Now, they continued a short while from 1299 through 1922 CE. Now, they received a deadly wound at the walls of Vienna. Now, they were defeated militarily in battle in 1683, and the Ottoman Empire began to slowly re uh, devolve down until it finally broke up after World War I in 1922. Now, today, President Erdogan wants to restore uh, the Ottoman Empire, and he's making a lot of noise about that. Uh, there's all this action with ISIS, and we'll talk more about that. But this is the effectively the rising up of the Arab world, uh, which we saw began around 9-11 and uh, continues on forward to today. But coming back to Revelation 17 and verse 11, it says, the beast that was, meaning Babylon, and is not, because it was Rome in the first century, not Babylon, he says, is himself also the eighth. And again, we saw that the, the final outcome that they're going for is the establishment of a Babylonian new world order. He says, and is of the seven, because Babylon was first of the seven, and is going to perdition, as what we'll see later, is that it's the beast, which is Rome, and the false prophet, which we believe is Muhammad. Those, are, uh, those two go to perdition, or the lake of fire. So now, briefly, we'll just talk about how the healing of the beast's deadly wounds. So Catholicism is going to be healed. They're seeking to heal it through what's called the ecumenical movement. And that is simply a move to bring all of the Christians uh, back in under the papacy by focusing on uh, their similarities and not their differences. And, of course, the Pope would love that. Uh, and there's a lot of people, there are a lot of Christians out there that they don't understand why there isn't ecumenical unity. So this is going to be one of the points that we will see is a, a restoration of Rome, and we're also going to see a restoration of Islam, possibly with the caliphate. So, but if we're talking about the restoration of Islam or a caliphate, so to speak, we should also talk about the restoration of Satan's seat, or this is actually, it's a uh, Zeus's throne, and what we'll see is that it's mentioned uh, in the book of Revelation, in an earlier chapter, so chapter 2 and verse 12, it says, And to the messenger of the assembly in Pergamos, that's in Turkey, write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. So uh, we know from history that Antipas was killed in Pergamos. This is the location of Pergamos in western Turkey. This is the ancient site of Zeus's throne in Pergamos in Turkey. And this is what is called Satan's seat here. Now, uh, what we need to understand, so the sequence and progression, you had uh, first in the Macedonian Empire with the Greek religion, that was the god of light or the god of the sun, sun god was Zeus. And then Zeus later became Jupiter in the Roman pantheon. But if we take a look, this is Zeus's throne. 
or it's also, this is what's being referred to as Satan's seed. Now, this was standing in Pergamos in Turkey during the time the book of Revelation was written. There's some very important things we can notice about this Satan's seat. Uh, one is the, it's got a, a central staircase leading up the middle, and we're going to see variations on the theme here, but there's a central staircase. There's also what we might call two bookends, so to speak, and then we have, uh, all together, it forms what might be called a horseshoe shape. And so these things are going to be very important. We're going to take a look. But let's first see where Satan's seat, or Zeus's throne, where might that go? Well, Zeus, we know, is the same as Jupiter. So let's take a look at some more information. Let's take some more things in here. So we're going to see three temples to Jupiter, or Zeus, or uh, Lucifer, effectively, in this slide. So on the left, we have St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And then in the center, we have a diagram of the Temple of Jupiter Stator, which was another temple to Jupiter or Zeus. And then we have on the right, we have the Dome of the Rock. So now notice they all three have uh, a mammary gland or a breast with a nipple at the top of the cupola, effectively. And then you can see in uh, St. Peter's Basilica on the left, you have the obelisk of Osiris, uh, which is basically a phallus symbol out front. So uh, it makes some sense that there could be a correlation between a temple of Jupiter, and we know, again, that the Dome of the Rock is already built, uh, in the form of a temple to Jupiter, again, Jupiter uh, being worshipped in the Babylonian pantheon because Greece and Rome were part of the Babylonian sequence. It's the same Babylonian spirits all the way through at each step of the game, but we can identify some of them by name at certain points in time. But now notice, as we go inside the Dome of the Rock, we see a horseshoe-shaped rock. Uh, some scholars have speculated that this could host a horseshoe-shaped throne uh, for whoever it is that is supposed to sit on it in the end times, which we know being the anti-Messiah. So people, but people ask, they say, well, why should there be any significant, what do we care about Satan's throne? I mean, you know, what, what is it to us? Well, okay, so let's, let's understand the kind of power. If there's going to be something similar to Satan's throne set up, on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, on the rock, underneath the Dome of the Rock, which is already a temple to Jupiter, uh, then wouldn't it, make, wouldn't it be good for us to know if we know that we're looking at an upcoming anti-Messiah's temple, uh, if there were certain powers associated with Satan's seat, wouldn't it be interesting to know that? Wouldn't it be good to know Satan's devices? So let's take a look at the history behind Satan's seat. In 1871, Zeus's altar, or Satan's seat, was moved to Berlin. And, uh, today it's uh, housed in the Pergamon Museum. So then in 1902, Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm II had the entire structure of Zeus's, the whole compound, brought to Berlin and set up. In 1913, Germany also brought the gates of physical Babylon to Germany from Iraq. And then it was the very next year that the First World War began. So what we see is Zeus's throne goes places and then war erupts. We're going to see that again for the Second World War. So Adolf Hitler was a member of the Thule Society, also known as the Skull and Bones. In 1934, he was elected the leader of Germany. And after this, he built what's called the Tribune at Zeppelin Field in Nuremberg as a center for his Nazi rallies, and it was uh, specifically based upon Zeus's throne, upon Zeus's altar. And we'll, we'll take a look at that. And then it was five years after that that World War II began. So again, what we see is wherever Zeus's throne goes, war goes. Now here's a picture of Hitler's Tribune at Zeppelin Field in Nuremberg, Germany. So what we can see, it's uh, again, it's based on Zeus's throne, but we have this central staircase. We have the two, what we might call bookends on either end, and then we have effectively a horseshoe shape. So it follows the same pattern, and it was, uh, it's, it's meant as a tribute. That's the point. But let's take a look at some further uh, historical data on Satan's throne. It was in the Ottoman Empire during the Ottoman Empire's years of power from 1299 up through 
1871 when Satan's throne was taken to Germany. It was in Germany for World Wars I and II. And then after World War II in 1948, it was taken to the Soviet Union. And this is the same year that Israel, the Zionist Israel, was born uh, as per Albert Pike's prophecy. So we know 1948 was a, an important year and then the Soviet Union also, of course, gained nuclear capability uh, around that time, and then things became much more complex. So Satan's throne was returned to Germany in 1958, but the point is that uh, it was there during the rise to power. Now, taking things chronologically, in 2008, uh, President Obama made his acceptance speech. They built uh, what we believe, what many believe, is a, a another copy of the uh, Zeus's throne or Satan's seat uh, for his acceptance speech at the Democratic National Convention. He's got the central staircase, uh, and then he's got the two bookends, so to speak, and it forms a horseshoe shape. So, in given the uh, fact of uh, the o President Obama agenda, it makes a lot of sense. But now, uh, the Turkish government has asked for Germany to return Satan's throne to Turkey by 2023. And again, so we're looking forward to the, well, looking forward, uh, we're looking at the beast's deadly wound being healed. Now, we don't know exactly how that will take place, but it does make some sense that if Satan's throne is returned to Turkey uh, by 2023, then we might look for the rise of a caliphate coming out of Turkey at that time. But Revelation speaks of a different direction. So here it says in Revelation 17 and verse 12, it says, the 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings. As we saw before, these are the 10 New World Order super nations that are planned by the Club of Rome. So these 10 horns our ten kings, he says, who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So there's some discussion as to exactly how long an hour is in uh, a heavy vision like Revelation. So one hour can hypothetically mean a while, although I don't know why it would. It can also refer to a literal hour, but it doesn't make any sense in context because you don't set up a 10 global kingships for one hour. If we use the principle in Ezekiel 4 of a day for a year in prophecy, then it works out to about 15 days, which also doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you're talking about establishing 15 global kingships. But if we use the principle from 2 Peter 3 and verse 8, that a day in prophecy can be as a thousand earth years and a thousand years are as one prophetic day, then if you run the numbers and do the math, you come up effectively with 41 and two thirds years. So the question then becomes, can we find a suitable space? Does this fit with the proposed revelation timeline? So let's take a look. We believe it does or it can potentially work. So let's, let's, first thing we need to understand, we believe it does work. The first thing we need to understand is that the fifth seal, as we mentioned before, was perhaps the Twin Tower incident on the September 11th tragedy, 2001. Now, we can also suppose that the Arab Spring, which was the, uh, uh, the Iranian hostage crisis under President Jimmy Carter, we, can, we could uh, potentially include that in the fifth seal. A lot of people believe that the Arab Spring began as early as 1979, but uh, effectively, we believe that the fifth seal uh, was when the uh, martyrs cried out for justice. That took place at September the 11th, 2001, or at least not later than that. So then when we get to the sixth seal, we're looking at the sun becoming black as sackcloth of hair and the moon becoming like blood. Well, some people believe that this was fulfilled by the total solar eclipse on August the 21st, 2017. And there's a, it was a famous, so ran through a number of biblically named places. And there's supposed to be another eclipse, which is a complicating factor, but another eclipse on April the 8th, 2024, which will come the other way across the United States, forming a giant X. Now, if this solar eclipse was the opening of seal six, what we need to understand is it isn't entirely necessary 
that uh, things happen, you know, uh, one on the heels of another. So it does, it's not seal five, then seal six, then seal seven, but there's some space in between them that, that takes place. So in Revelation chapter six and verse 14, one of the things that's supposed to take place after seal six is opened, although maybe not immediately, it says, then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. It says, and every mountain, referring to governments, and every island, and island, meaning national boundaries, was moved out of its place. And this is exactly what we would expect when the, a new world order is set up. We're waiting on an engineered nuclear conflict and then from this nuclear conflict, there will be the rise of the 10 super nations and redistricting and changes to borders and changes in power structure and all of these things. So just keeping these things in, uh, adapting these things, you know, what we're looking for is 41 years, 41 and two thirds years. So if we start at seal five in the second line down under the five, so that's the tragedy at 9-11, then if seal six was witnessed by the uh, total solar eclipse, then that would be effectively a 16 year delay in between seal five and seal six. Now it could be longer if you're taking, if you're talking back to the 1979 hostage crisis, uh, it could be longer if you're also waiting for the second solar eclipse uh, before this begins. But if we start with the first solar eclipse, as opening seal six. Now we're waiting for the sky to recede like a scroll. And when that takes place, we're gonna see the rise of a new world order government. About that same time, we'll also begin to see the sealing of the 144,000. Now these, uh, well, we'll talk about that in more detail later, but, but they dedicate an entire inset chapter to that. So there is some span of time between seal six and seal seven, between when the sky uh, when the sun turns black as sackcloth of hair and when we get to seal seven and it opens up the half hour of silence in heaven. So uh, we're hypothesizing, let's just say 13 years. Let's just put 13 years in there because first you have 16 and then if you come down to 13, that seems to work. We'll, we'll do the math here in a moment. Then we come to seven years of the trumpets. The cups don't take much more time after that. And Armageddon is, Armageddon is another 75 days beyond that. So if we take this and put it on a chart, I just wanna uh, show you how we're getting to this potential and I'm, I'm trying to present things to you that we know or we believe we know as things that we know and things that we're not completely clear on. I'm trying to explain that to you. Uh, this is a brand new, uh, Yahweh just gave this to me uh, two days ago. So I'm, I'm ho it, it feels right, but it hasn't been proven. We're gonna put here in the video. So if there's a period of 13 years from seal six to seal seven, and then we know there will be a half an hour of silence after seal seven opens before we get to the trumpets. And that works out to 20.83 years. And then if the trumpets last for seven years, as we believe they will, and the cups take a little bit longer and it takes a little bit longer to get to Armageddon. So it's maybe seven plus or seven and a third years, something like that. So if we put all of those things together, we have 13 years plus 20, point, or 20 years and 10 months, seven years and little, it works out to about 41 and two thirds years, which would effectively be one hour that the new world order would have been risen to power. So uh, consider that and pray about it. Uh, that's uh, something Yahweh just showed me uh, just recently. But if we go to verse 13, continuing to verse 13, it says, these, referring to the 10 horns, the 10 super nations, are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. Well, of course they will. Uh, the beast has given them their authority, so of, support, of course they're going to support the beast in that. Although later there will be wars that break out uh, between the power centers of the world. So uh, in verse, can you in verse 14, it says, these will make war with the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them for he is master of masters and king of kings. And those who are with him are called, chosen and faithful. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits 
are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, meaning effectively that uh, they're electorates. So continuing in verse 16, it says, And the ten horns, or the ten supernations, which you saw in the beast, these will hate the harlot, referring to the united religion, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. And the reason why is because these, uh, the ten supernations are led by ten kings. Well, these kings in particular, they don't worship Yahweh. They're effectively secular. So, you know, what, what do they care for a religion, a state-sponsored, made-up religion anyway? That, that doesn't make any sense to them. They don't, they don't want to abide by that. So, continuing to verse 17, For Elohim has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast, until the words of Elohim are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city, which is Rome which reigns over the kings of the earth. So what we've seen is we've seen Revelation chapter 17, falling between the cups in Armageddon. Please join me again for the next slide set, which is chapter 18, which describes Babylon and Rome and her fall and what that means to us as believers. Shalom.